You're listening to Talking Taiwan with your host, Felicia Lin. Courtney Donovan Smith is co founder of Taiwan Report, ICRT's Central Taiwan correspondent and contributing columnist to Taiwan News. I'm welcoming him back onto Talking Taiwan to talk about the local elections that were held in Taiwan in November of last year. He'll share his insights on the outcome of the November elections and what it could mean for Taiwan's presidential election in 2024. We talked about plagiarism and how it's plagued political candidates from all three political parties, the DPP, KMT, and TPP. Donovan also shared his analysis on how each of the major political parties in Taiwan fared in the election. While it might be a bit too early to discuss the 2024 presidential candidates, we'll definitely have Donovan back on at a later date to discuss Taiwan's 2024 presidential election. This episode of Talking Taiwan has been sponsored by NATOA, the North America Taiwanese Women's Association. NATOA was founded in 1988, and its mission is 1. To evoke a sense of self-esteem and enhance women's dignity. 2. To oppose gender discrimination and promote gender equality. 3. To fully develop women's potential and encourage their participation in public affairs. 4. To contribute to the advancement of human rights and democratic development in Taiwan. 5. To reach out and work with women's organizations worldwide to promote peace for all. To learn more about NATWA, visit their website, www.natwa.com. Without further ado, here's our interview. Welcome to the podcast, Donovan. It's great to be back. We wanted to have you back because Taiwan had elections in November and we are not a news podcast. It's just so hard for us to keep up with that. But you guys do such a great job of that at Taiwan Report. So I thought that it would be good for you to share about what happened. So maybe we could talk a little bit for people who haven't been watching. What were the positions that were elected in November? And then what was the outcome of the elections? Okay, so they're called the nine-in-one elections, and it's because depending on where you are, there can be as many as nine levels of government posts being elected for. So, for example, if you are in Zhanghua County, not one of the special municipalities, you could be voting for your local township chief or your local town councilors all the way up through the real big positions, you know, beyond and then there's city councillors and county councillors and then when you go all the way up to the top you're electing the heads of either the counties or the cities so there's the big six special municipalities and then when you add in all the counties there's a total of 22 and that's where you get most of the attention uh, is on those races and now the result was the worst result for the dpp since the party founded They won only five of the top positions. So it was a terrible result for the DPP. And then the KMT won the majority. There was a couple of independents were elected, most notably in Miao Li and Jim Man. And the TPP picked up their first one, the mayorship of Shinju City, which is a good pickup for the TPP. So now they have at least a high-profile position there with Ann Gao as the new mayor. So... What would you say are the implications of the results of the local elections? Like, what does it tell us about what the citizens care about? And does it have any larger implications for their presidential election in 2024? Well, okay, based on voting patterns from the last four election cycles, in theory, it shouldn't have too much of an impact. And the reason I say this is that the DPP won in landslides in the last two national elections. And the KMT won in landslides in the last two local 9-in-1 elections. Now, the big question is whether or not that pattern will continue to hold through to this upcoming elections. And there are a lot of variables that I think need to be sorted out first. Now, the DPP, I think, has lost some momentum. I think the TPP is picking up some momentum, although overall they did quite badly. 
The KMT, we still don't know who the KMT presidential candidate is going to be, and that's going to be a very big question mark. And we know that the TPP is probably going to run with Kowenza. He said repeatedly he plans to run. And Lai Qingde, who previously went by the name William, but no longer does, um, the vice president, he won the party chair position unopposed. And traditionally, the party chair is the party's candidate. So the real big question marks are who are going to run on the KMT side. But we also learned a lot coming out of this last election, strategically some missteps on the part of the DPP. And the KMT, a lot of people saying that it was a huge success for them, and that's sort of true. But we saw that strategically the KMT was superior to the DPP in the last election cycle, hands down. So that being said, Eric Ju or Julie Luen, the KMT chair did make some mistakes. And also uh, Tsai Ing-wen was the chair of the DPP and she stepped down because of the poor performance of the DPP in the election. And so what can we expect from the new chairman, do you think? Yeah, it's customary if you lose an election so badly here in Taiwan for the party chair to step down to take responsibility. She did the same thing, by the way, incidentally, after the 2018 debacle. <laughs> so uh, this has happened twice now. I can give you a detailed blow by blow what went wrong for them. She doesn't have a lot of experience in local politics. So she's excellent, for example, at dealing with foreign governments and heads of state and dealing with China and all of these things. She's only ever won in one local election, and there's a series of missteps. Now, what to expect from William Lai, or Lai Qingde, as he's now known? He, like Eric Ju on the KMT side, both of them are very experienced in local politics. And so both of them are experienced, and they're knowledgeable in elections at all levels. And both of them are very, very experienced. Now, Eric Ju has the advantage of being a full-time party chair, unless he becomes the party's candidate, and that's a whole other discussion. (laughs) But so this is two heavyweights, but the potential problem that Lai Qingda has on the DPP side is he's currently serving as the vice president. And if he's a presidential candidate, and if he's a party chair, he could also be a little bit more distracted than Eric Ju particularly if Eric Jew just stays as party chair and doesn't run for president. So there's that. But again, both of them are heavyweights. Both of them are very experienced. And so I think it'd be very interesting strategically. Now, Lai Qingde is still almost all polling and has been for years the second most popular politician in the country. And for years, you see it less commonly now, but for years he was referred to as the God Lai. He was so popular. And he became nationally prominent, I think I should say, when he stared down a vote buying and corruption scandal in the Tainan City Council back when he was the mayor there. And he boycotted the city council for a while, which actually got him censored by the control yen later. But he stared them down and eventually the vote buying scandal you know, there was convictions and all of that. But he gained national prominence as someone who stood up to corruption and refused to budge. So he still has a very good reputation. Now, strategically, he's started laying out a few things which I think are interesting. Now, in the last two election cycles, the DPP went with, you know, Fan Zhong Bao Tai as their slogan, which You can translate it different ways, but basically it means resist China and protect Taiwan. Now, this was used to great effect in 2020 in the national elections. And this makes a lot of sense because it's a catchy little short phrase, but it gives you a good sense of where politically they stand. So when you're electing your president, that kind of gives you an overarching sense of what her priorities are going to be when choosing cabinet ministers, you know, the minister of defense, the minister of foreign affairs. It also matters when you're voting on your legislators, because, of course, your legislators are voting on things of national security importance. They pass the military budget. They pass the anti-infiltration laws or don't, as the case may be. It's very useful in the national elections. In the last local elections, The DPP, this is one of the giant missteps. 
they continued trying to run on that slogan. But here's the thing. When you're voting for your local city councilor, most people associate that with things like, you know, your local dog park and budgets for sewage maintenance. And so Resist China, Protect Taiwan came across to a lot of voters as just being a kind of cynical nationalistic slogan or ploy. You know, it didn't come across as very relevant. Now, the frustrating thing, and I wrote about this in the Taiwan News prior to the election, is I said, look, the DPP could have added to their campaign platforms, especially for, you know, the mayors and county commissioners, but also at city and county council level. They could have actually made that line meaningful because they could have included in their platform. I'm not suggesting they should have made this their only platform and you have to have your dog parks and, you know, (laughs) your infrastructure and your clean energy bus policy and that kind of stuff. But they easily could have added some as one of their planks, something that would have made that slogan make sense because cities normally, and this sometimes becomes a campaign issue after say big flooding problems, They often do campaign on things like preparation for typhoons and flooding and earthquakes. You know, these are sometimes planks and campaign issues. They could have included one for preparing for a potential invasion. So, for example, air raid shelters, Michael Turton actually went out and researched this here in Taichung. Air raid shelters are often just that in name. They're often storage facilities in, you know, basements and stuff like this. They're full of stuff, you know, that's totally inadequate for the job. So, for example, a city government could have put in a plank saying, you know, we will work on the air raid shelters. We will work on hardening certain types of infrastructure. We'll come out with a plan to start training and preparing integration across, say, higher emergency rescue and police departments. You know, if there's bombings. These are the kinds of things they could have added as a platform to make it meaningful, but instead it just came across as cynical. That wasn't the only problem the DPP had, but there was a anecdotally, pretty much everyone is saying that a lot of younger voters just simply stayed home this time around, and they traditionally tend to support the DPP more. A lot of them also in opinion polling have moved some back to the KMT, not a huge amount, but also to the TPP as an alternative. And I think that a lot of young voters in the last election kind of felt like they were being taken granted for by the DPP. So what Lai Qingde has done, which I find quite interesting, is he's come out with a new slogan, which is peace and protect Taiwan, which is actually much closer to the KMT's messaging. I suspect he thought that KMT's messaging was a bit more effective in the last election and figures this might be better for independent voters. That's my guess. He also is pledging to crack down on plagiarism, which was a big problem in this last election. Zhe Jin, the former mayor of uh, Shinju City, when he got caught up in this plagiarism scandal, he lost both of his degrees. Both of his theses were, the university said they were plagiarized. He denies that that is the case, and he's continuing to fight them on this. But this is another one of the big strategic failings on the part of the DPP. What happened was, is that this scandal broke, then another scandal broke. When Lin was mayor of Shinju, there was a massive renovation of a baseball stadium. Then they played a couple of games and players got injured. They found that the contractor had put like, you know, pipes and bricks and stuff in the field. It was a total disaster. And the stadium now has had to be closed indefinitely. It was such a botched renovation. And that kind of made it look like he wasn't as competent. Now, the thing is that directly from President Tsai, who is, of course, then the party chair, she ordered that the party stand by him. She issued the order personally, in spite of the fact that it was looking worse and worse and worse and worse as you've got this drip, 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 of just constant bad news coming out. And she kept it going far longer than she should have. And that, I think, really hurt the DPP in the North. They had come into this election cycle looking very strong in Shinju City, Taoyuan uh, City. They had a decent shot early on, I thought, of winning Taipei and also keeping Jilo. And they lost three of their, you know, where they'd had two back-to-back wins in Shinju City Taoyuan City and Jilong City, where they had popular mayors in all three, 
and had won back-to-back elections, but then they were term limited out. And I think it really hurt them straight across the board, mostly in northern Taiwan. And the DPP lost everything in the north. So it was a bit of a disaster for them. And so Lai is saying that he's going to crack down on that. I'm not really sure what that means. He has some problems. Sung Wen San, for example, is one of the most powerful figures in the party. He got caught up in this in the end, and he's the former Taiwan mayor, and he just got appointed to the cabinet. And, you know, he even has his own sub-faction of the New Tide faction, which is Lai Qingde's faction as well. Lai also has his own sub-faction in New Tide. So, you know, but President Tsai appointed him to the cabinet. And so what is Lin going to do with people like him who got caught up in these things? And we don't know. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't expelled them from the party or anything like that. My guess is that probably what he's going to do is do a lot more vetting of candidates going forward. Oh, and by the way, DPP knew that there were questions surrounding Lin's thesis even before they ran him as a candidate. Can you Um, talk about that a little bit more? Because I know that there's been a number of plagiarism scandals before this, and so it just seems to be a thing now for people that don't know. Can you talk a little bit about that background? Okay, the first time that I'm aware of that this ever happened was after Daniel Han Guoyu lost in the recall and was booted out as mayor right. of Kaohsiung. The KMT candidate was found to have plagiarized her thesis, Jane Lee. And incidentally, right. I actually played a minor role in that election. She came out with a shirt with a, a blazer and a white shirt, which looked like it said nothing across the front of it. <laughs> So I commented on this and she, I think on the ad that she created also said, you know, young and she's trying to reach young voters. I made a comment on social media. You know, if you want to reach young voters, you might not want to pitch yourself as having nothing. Um, (laughs) Right. And this got picked up for two or three news cycles. You know, TV news came in and interviewed me and it kind of turned into a big thing. I think she's going to lose no matter what. The plagiarism scandal was, I think, really what definitely sunk her. But my social media post didn't help. It wasn't meant to be that mean. It was more sort of a criticism of her, you know, marketing. So obviously there's tools now to really sort of look into plagiarism. You know, they're a lot better than in the past. Yeah. And so in this election cycle, following that, the recall in the post recall Gaucho mayoral race, they started using this a lot more. And this hit all three of the major parties. But here's the thing. The DPP is generally judged a lot harsher by their supporters and independents right. on this sort of thing. For example, you know, on the pan blue side, you had the KMT candidate in Elan. It wasn't plagiarism. There was a massive corruption. She's on trial for wide scale corruption mm-hmm. case. Um, the KMT booted him out of the party, but he was the KMT, the speaker of the county council in Miao Li. So he's still very pan blue. I mean, he spells his name in China's Han Yu Pinin for crying out loud. And he is a convicted murderer. He has multiple convictions for organized crime related things. He kicked off his campaign by saying that he wasn't a murderer or a rapist. He only stabbed a friend of his and committed criminal adultery. (laughs) Then there's all kinds of allegations that I don't even need to get into. I think you get the idea about Mm -hmm. this guy. He's pan blue and he won in Miao Li. And there's others. But the thing is that the KMT, the reputation they have, and also within their support base, is that the KMT is a party of getting things done. But when they get things done, they often get their hands a bit dirty while doing it. And the DPP's reputation is as the reform party. They're supposed to be, and for years, they campaigned on what Taiwanese call black gold politics, which is corrupt politics. And then it didn't help that there was a corruption scandal surrounding the speaker candidate and deputy speaker candidate on the DPP side in the Tainan City Council. And there was some shootings involved, and it just was not a good look. So that's the third thing that Lai Qingde is planning to tackle. But to get back to that point, though, so the DPP has this reputation of not necessarily being as effective at getting things done as the KMT, but they're supposed to be the clean ones. And so that was another thing which hurt the party. Now, on the corruption thing, actually, this is very positive for the DPP to have Lai Qingde as the party chair and presumably at this point, their presidential nominee, because he does have a reputation for being clean. 
And he knows the figures involved in Tainan, so he's presumably well positioned to deal with this. Now, the investigation's still ongoing in Tainan, and it just keeps getting worse. And of course, the DPP Tainan mayor only won re-election with, I think it was a 4.4% over the KMT candidate. Mm. But the KMT candidate was a fairly strong one as well. But, you know, usually the DPP wins by double digit margins in Tainan. <laughs> so this was not a good result. And now for a short break. Hello, listeners. I'm excited to share that we have a donor who has offered Talking Taiwan a matching donation of $5,000. That means when we raise $5,000, it will be automatically doubled to $10,000. So this is the time for you to make a contribution to Talking Taiwan and help us raise $10,000. You can make a contribution to Talking Taiwan on GoFundMe.com, Patreon.com, forward slash Talking Taiwan, or PayPal and Zelle using our email address TalkingTaiwanPodcast at gmail.com. Or if you're old school, just send us a check to our mailing address, which you'll find on our website at TalkingTaiwan.com forward slash support. All of our donors will get exclusive first listening access to my interviews with Robert Tao, founder of UMC, who in August of 2022 Let's to donate 100 million U.S. dollars to help Taiwan defend itself. Kevin Lin, one of the co-founders of Twitch and current co-founder and CEO of Meta Theory. The Boba Guys, co-founders Andrew Chow and Bin Chen. Chin Chi Yang, a multidisciplinary artist who has been inducted into the New York Foundation for the Arts Hall of Fame. And Michelle Ho, an attorney, activist, and author of Reading with Patrick, which is a runner-up for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the Goddard Riverside Stefan Russo Book Prize for Social Justice. We'd like to thank our first donor of the year, the Greater New York Region Overseas Taiwanese Pen Club, and all of our supporters. Now, back to the episode. I should, by the way, just quickly note that when it comes to city and county councillors, the DPP actually did better than the last time around. They did pick up some seats there. But Eric Ju and the KMT, for the most part, he screwed up in Miaoli, he screwed up in Jinmen, and Independence won in both cases, and to a lesser degree, I'd say, in Shinju City. But something that I think Lai Chinga needs to learn, and as far as I can tell, he hasn't said anything about this yet, but Eric Ju ran heavily on female candidates. And so they came out and said, look, of the 22 executive positions, we're running 10 women versus the DPP's five. And here's an interesting statistic. Post-election, when you looked at, like, for example, all the city and county council votes and all this, two-thirds of women candidates won. Only 50 percent of men running won their election. And this is a trend that's actually been going on through several election cycles now. And Eric Chu picked up on this. But the DPP, for some reason, just hasn't gotten the message. And if I can figure this out, you know, going into into this election cycle from viewing the last few election cycles, you would think that the professionals in the DPP would have, but apparently not. I mean, maybe Lai Chingda will, maybe he'll figure that out. But this is an ongoing trend. In the last national elections, I believe 40, 44, 45 percent, something like that, of the legislators were female. If the DPP leans in more heavily on this, because the KMT already is, the TPP has already said something similar. Um, Ke the, the the chair of the TPP, has said something similar as well. So there's a very good chance that the next legislature will be over 50% women. There's a pretty good shot of that. And you said that the plagiarism scandals affected all three parties. So you mentioned the DPP, the KMT, and what about the TPP? Yeah. One of their legislators, Tsai Biru, she was one of the most high profile figures in the party. She got brought down. In her case, she said that the plagiarism was, quote, only 18 percent. And there were some other cases at other universities and some other examples where apparently they were able to keep their thesis or were asked to revive their thesis and keep their degrees. But they had higher percentages than her. That's her take on this. You know, I'm not an academic, so I'm not going to comment yeah. there. But she was one of the highest profile figures in the TPP, also got felled by this. And she resigned as a legislator as a result. 
Going back to what you were saying earlier about how it seemed like a lot of the young voters didn't come out, I'm not sure about the timing of this because I know that there was also a referendum held to lower the voting age from 20 to 18 and it didn't pass. Did that have any bearing on the voter turnout, do you think? No, I don't think so. That referendum was doomed to fail. The simple fact is, let's put it this way, it would have been needed to be something like 75% or something like that of all voters that actually turned up to vote yes on it. A majority did vote yes on it, but not 50 some odd percent. And that's because you have to get over half of the entire electorate, a lot of whom don't show up, to vote yes. So that means that the threshold was too high. Yeah, this is an ongoing Um, challenge for Taiwan's referendums, this threshold. But there may be a legal way to solve this particular Mm -hmm. issue. This is not an original idea on my part. I saw a legal scholar wrote about this because the Constitution guarantees voting rights for people aged 20 and up. But there's nothing there saying that the legislature couldn't give it to people, 18 and 19 year olds. There's nothing stopping them from doing that. It's just it's guaranteed in the Constitution for people over 20. So the legislature could possibly pass something if they put their minds to it. But I'm not sure how aware they are of this scholar's Mm -hmm. comments. I don't know how many of them are reading my columns in the Taiwan News or listening to Taiwan (laughs) Report. (laughs) I know some politicians are aware of me, but I'm guessing that a lot of them aren't looking to English political analysis Mm -hmm. as their primary source. But you are providing such a tremendous resource because I remember the days when it was very hard to get English language uh, analysis and coverage of politics in Taiwan. So I think it's really important, the work that you're doing. That actually makes me want to talk to you a little bit about how you actually got interested in this, because, I mean, you really do quite a deep analysis. And I'm just wondering, how did you get interested in politics in Taiwan? And have you always been interested in politics in general? I loved history as a kid. uh, And politics is basically history in the making. A lot of people follow sports. But my comment on that is, you know, the ultimate champion in a sport gets maybe a ring or a trophy, something like that, and some endorsement deals. But when you're the ultimate winner in politics, you get a standing army. (laughs) You know, the stakes are big. And Taiwan politics is very interesting. I mean, you know, you look at the personalities involved and the conflicts and alliances, and there's always surprises and things that you never expect. But I was more known for co-publishing city guides. And so I was much more well known for writing about things like parties and new restaurants and stuff like that. That's what I was known for, organizing music festivals. And then there was the Sunflower Movement. And I realized that I knew more than most people writing on Taiwan politics. <laughs> and I felt like I'd gotten my permanent residency not too long before that. And I felt like, you know, I have a stake here. This is, this is home. Now, that being said, there were some excellent bloggers and writers out there. For a while, there was Solidarity.tw, who was excellent, mostly for mm-hmm. translating some stuff. Of course, Michael Turton, his blog, and he's still writing for the Taipei Times weekly, but I miss his blog very much. He's more obviously pan-green than I am. We're both pan-green and we hang out all the time. He wears it on his sleeve a little bit more obviously sure. than I do. Nathan Batto for his blog, Frozen Garlic. Unfortunately, he's not writing that much anymore. Solidarity.tw left. The author left the country. Who I can't mm-hmm. name. He wanted to be anonymous. And Michael Turton isn't writing daily or many times a week anymore. He's only writing once a week. Those two had a big influence on me, and I learned a lot from them. But there's another element which may surprise you. I took some time off a few years where I was only working part-time, and I developed my own RPG game, which actually had players, you know, as a dice, paper style role-playing game. There were people playing it all around the world, and then a staff member of mine accidentally lost the domain name. But anyways... But the thing was, is that when I created storylines for my own games, where I was the, you know, the equivalent of a dungeon master, the game Mm -hmm. master, I had very politically complex stories. And this meant that I had to consider the motivations of all the different players, whether they were good or bad. But usually bad people don't view themselves as bad, if you see what I mean. So I kind of had to flesh out these characters 
from a kind of a more objective step back sort of way. And so I think that kind of informs my writing because the reason I'm not usually very, my, my articles, for example, are in the opinion section, but they don't go heavy on the opinion is because my readership and the listenership on Taiwan Report are generally people who are journalists, think tankers, diplomats. There's some politicians in there and also people who are just passionate about Taiwan. And these people all are pretty knowledgeable. So what I'm really going for is to be informative and useful rather than tell them what to think. So, you know, Mike Turton, his comments sometimes are, you know, he says, yeah, that piece is really fair, too fair. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, primarily, I mean, I am sometimes opinionated. For example, on the referendum to lower the voting age, I came out very forcefully with an opinion on that. When I'm doing political analysis of, you know, who's doing what, what are their strategies and that sort of thing. I generally just try and take a step back, understand it, analyze it, and then present the information that I found. And of course, I spend hours every day going through local newspapers from all different political perspectives. And in the background, I often have local TV news on. So I'm often looking at sources that people who are looking in the English media sphere don't see or hear. So I'll write about things like the DPP factions, which People just don't write about in English yeah. anymore, but they're a big deal. And if you read the local media, you'll see they're referenced all the time. But if you're a journalist here, and even if you want to write about it, and this is part of the reason I wrote it, you know, wrote about them is so that there's something to link to. But Taiwanese know who these factions are. They know what their backgrounds are. They know something, you know, they're a bit murky, but they have some idea of how they operate. But if you're, say, a foreign journalist, not doing you know analysis pieces like I am. And if you're a local journalist and say you want to reference that Lin Jialong is the head of the Zhongguo Hui, which has this really long convoluted English names, name rectification, anyway, it's very long, of this faction. If you're a journalist here and you want to write about that in English, then you kind of, you're obligated to explain you know, what is this faction and what are factions, you know? <laughs> so I've written some analysis pieces, which I'm hoping that more writers can just use to link to as a resource so that they can actually mention these and then link to something that if people don't know what, what they're talking about, that then they can find out. And that's, you know, the reason I wrote, you know, a couple of pieces on them. I've written about the KMT factions. So I'm trying to bring out a, a lot of knowledge of Taiwan politics that I'm getting from local sources to English speaking audiences. But a lot of the analysis I do is original on all of it. Uh, there's some very good Taiwanese analysts out there, but you know, I'm feeling pretty good uh, about my analysis. Prior to this last election, I published a prediction piece and correctly called 20 of the 22 um, elections. I got Jim Men wrong, but you know, I understand mainland Taiwan politics better than Jim Men, right. so I don't feel too bad about that. <laughs> But I did badly screw up on Geelong. Oh, I got that one. You were wrong. <laughs> so your Chinese must be very good because you have to read a lot of Chinese sources and listen to a lot of local news, right? It could be better. My reading's pretty good, but I still stumble sometimes, you know, particularly in like the Liberty Times, it'll transliterate Taiwanese expressions. And I mm. don't always know those. And then often more likely in pan blue media, but not always. You get these writers, particularly analysts and academics who use the, you know, those four idiom phrases. Mm. And I'm not as good at reading those. So I sometimes stumble on those things, but your general vocabulary for yeah. politics is fine. Put me in the fashion section and I'm hopeless. So-so <laughs> <You know, laughs> in the sports section, put me in the politics section or the hard news, you know, crime stuff, because I also did Central Taiwan News. I'm okay in those parts of the newspapers. Give me a teen romance novel, and again, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I can see what the appeal is, because I think covering politics and looking at, as you said, the politicians and all the personalities and the backgrounds, you have to get into the psychology. It's kind of like observing a real-life drama or soap opera in some oh, yeah. ways, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it is fascinating to watch. This coming election cycle, the KMT, uh, who's going to become the candidate for the KMT is very interesting. Mm -hmm. The ticket's going to be there. Um, Hoyoi, the new Taipei mayor, is the most popular politician in the country. 
However, in most polls, until the last month or two, they picked him as the most popular politician. But when asked, who do you think the next president should be in a hypothetical matchup between Ho, Lai Qingde, and Ke Wenzhe, they were picking Lai over Ho. But there have been a few polls recently that have actually shown Ho pulling ahead of Lai, which is very interesting. But the, there's two major problems that Ho is going to have to overcome. The first is that he's going to have to start taking stands, which he's only started doing recently tentatively, on what positions does he have regarding China, Taiwan sovereignty, Taiwan identity, cross-strait ties. And he's going to have to take a stand because, of course, the 1992 consensus is extremely unpopular. We've had when Johnny Jiang was the KMT chair, he tried to get rid of it, but a poll came out I saw where support for it within the party was over 80% and he had to mm-hmm. give up. Eric Ju has tried to tone it down, but under pressure, he's obviously brought it back. Mm-hmm. So he's emphasizing it again, but it's mm-hmm. deeply unpopular because it expressly affirms a one China stance. And for, for your listeners, the KMT's version of it is there is only one China, each side with its different interpretations. Whereas the Chinese Communist Party's version of it is there is only one China, period. And in 2019, Xi Jinping basically tied it to one country, two systems. So you can see why it's deeply unpopular here in Taiwan. So he's going to have to start taking stands. And if he goes one way, he'll appeal to centrists, but he'll lose some of his base. So the KMT stance follows the one China principle. Not the U.S. is one China policy, which actually doesn't take a stand on Taiwan sovereignty, whether it is or it's actually ambiguous. It's undetermined is the word that they use. The KMT affirms a one China principle, which is the same as the Chinese Communist Party's view. So that's the official platform of the KMT. And it's deeply unpopular. And after Xi Jinping tied it to one country, two systems, you know, that pretty much doomed it. So where is Hogan at stand on that? He's also got the problem is that his family's been in Taiwan for hundreds of years. And the party, there's a lot of power in the party elites in the KMT who's are from 49er families, is what I call them. And these are families who were exiled from China during the Chinese Civil War in or around 1949. I've been calling them 49ers, and I've seen some other people have picked that up. The, all the other terms carry biases. So a lot of people think that they w- will block Ho from running. But the tricky part is that the KMT primary normally is carried out in recent elections on public opinion polling. So if they want to stop him, because he definitely win if they hold a normal primary like that, they'll either do what Eric Ju did in the last local elections, which is directly make a top-down choice using the election committee and dictate who the candidate is, or they may try and go back to an older method of only allowing the vote to KMT members and or opinion polling KMT supporters. Those would be ways that they would try to block him if they're going to try and block him. We'll probably find out in March whether or not they're going to try and block him. Eric Ju is bandied around, you know, as party chair, because traditionally the party chair is the party's candidate. But in opinion polls, he comes in third after Kuenta. <laughs> so, you know, that's not a good look. Then there's talk of Terry Go, um, the founder of Foxconn. He ran last time in the KMT primary saying that Matsu told him in a dream to run and then he lost. <laughs> so apparently Matsu is having a bit of fun with him. He said this time around that he's going to let the gods decide whether he'll run or not. But he left the KMT in a huff last time. He quit the party. So he's not a KMT party member. There's speculation he may try to run under the Taiwan People's Party. But Ke Wenzhe's got a pretty big ego. Would he be willing to step aside for him? Strategically, from the perspective of the Taiwan People's Party, that would actually be a good idea. Because Terry Goh's got tremendous name recognition. It's a party that's in danger of being a one-man band under mm-hmm. Coenza, and this would help diversify that. And Terry Go is extremely rich, <laughs> and the TPP is resource poor compared to the bigger two parties. Mm-hmm. And then there's, uh, you know, possibility Lu Xiuyen, the Taichung mayor. She could be a dark horse candidate here. She's also quite popular. And then, of course, there's all the discussions on, you know, who could be the vice presidential pick. 
So those are the main actors. Uh, Zhao Shao Kang uh, has already declared he's going to probably run. I think he's a bit of a long shot. He's a very deep blue ideologue. Same with Zhang Yat-Jung, the head of Sun Yat School, the KMT School. He's a very deep blue ideologue, very pro-unification. Zhao Shao Kang is the head of the Broadcasting Corporation of China, deep, deep blue, pro-unification. And he was involved in the beginning of the new party at one point. But he's recently rejoined the KMT. There's a lot more we could go into, but I think you get the idea of why it's fascinating to watch. Thank you so much. Where's the best place for people to learn more about Taiwan Report and your writing? I put everything up on report.tw. I'll link to this from there as well. My Taiwan News columns are all up there. We're hopefully going to have a bunch of new content coming out. I've been so busy the last little while, a lot less content. But I think I've got a schedule worked out for the upcoming month or so where I should be able to come out with several shows a week, which I'm looking forward to. And it's an election year, so I really want to be out there. For your listeners and viewers, I'm pretty nerdy on the politics. (laughs) Like I say, my audience are people who are very interested in the topic, either personally or professionally or both. So that's really who I'm I'm trying to reach, not everyday people. But it's it's a great place to learn. Yes, absolutely. And you've also been on Taiwan Plus a lot more recently. I've seen that too. So people, they can catch some of your clips on Taiwan Plus as well. Always such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing your analysis. Yeah, it was great to be back. I love your show. You know, your Robert Tao interview just the other day was fantastic. I just shared that around on social media. So yeah, definitely keep it up. I know you're the longest running (laughs) podcaster out there and there's a good reason for it. You know, (laughs) it's always good interviews. You know, I'm glad to be back. I've been speaking with Courtney Donovan Smith about Taiwan's November 2022 9-in-1 elections. This episode of Talking Taiwan has been sponsored by NATOA, the North America Taiwanese Women's Association. NATOA was founded in 1988. To learn more about NATOA, visit their website, www.natwa.com. Now it's time for you to show us some love. We just found out that you can rate us on Spotify. Or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Audible, leave us a review there. It helps others to discover Talking Taiwan. To learn more about any of the items mentioned in this episode, visit our website, TalkingTaiwan.com. There will list any related links. Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Taiwan. I'm your host, Felicia Lin. Talking Taiwan is brought to you by Forumosa.com.